Good morning. Welcome to our Bible study this morning. This morning we're beginning a new seven-part series. The title of this series is, Why Does Evil Exist? We're going to be looking at <clears throat> the existence of evil, how it came into existence, and we're also going to be looking at why evil came into existence. During the course of our study, we'll be looking at many different Bible verses. So please keep a Bible handy as we look over this study and as we go over these things because all of the teaching in this series is going to be based upon what the Bible teaches us on this subject. Let me just say one more thing very quickly. There is a, a book that you can download for free from my blog. My blog is found at settledinheaven.wordpress.com. If you go to my blog, you'll see a tab at the top that says free books. Just click on that tab and you'll find a PDF book on why evil exists. You're welcome to download that. It's free of charge. It might help you as we go down through our study on this video. It'll be giving you the verses I use. It'll be giving you many of the main points that I bring out during the video. And it'll actually be bringing out more information to you that I can't cover on these videos. So again, if you look for the book, Why Evil Exists, go ahead and download it and use it during the course of this study if you would like. It's free of charge. You're welcome to it. Okay, to begin our study of why evil exists, I would like us to look at three different texts from God's Word. And what I would like us to notice as we look at these texts is, just notice the basic principle that's being taught in these texts. I think you'll find it's very interesting. Turn with me first of all, if you would please, to Isaiah 45 and verse number 7. Isaiah 45 and verse number 7. These verses will be familiar to some of you. Perhaps there's some of you who, who didn't even realize these verses existed in the Bible. You know, if you're like me, there are some verses in the Bible that I'm very familiar with that I... I know they exist in the Bible, and I've read them over and over again. There's other verses that I'm not as familiar with. So this verse is kind of an in-between for us. I think some of us probably know that this verse exists. There's others that are going to be surprised. that In the Bible, we find a verse that says this. Listen to what's said in Isaiah 45, verse 7. This is the Lord himself speaking, and here's what he says. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Now, folks, did you get what this verse says? This verse says, and this is from our Lord himself, he makes the statement, I create evil. Turn, if you will, please, to Habakkuk, chapter 1 and verse number 13. Habakkuk chapter 1 and verse number 13. Here we find another one of these verses that's very interesting. Once again, <clears throat> in this case we're talking about the Lord. This is the prophet Habakkuk that's speaking. Listen to what he says in Habakkuk 1.13. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil. This is Habakkuk's describing the Lord. He says, Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and cannot look on iniquity. Boy, folks, here we have Habakkuk describing the Lord, saying, Do you know what? The Lord is so holy. In other words, He is so pure. He is so sinless. He can't even look upon evil. He cannot look upon iniquity. Boy, there seems to be a contradiction, doesn't there? Back in the Isaiah passage, the Lord's made the statement, I create evil. Then Habakkuk turns around describing the Lord, says, Lord, you're so pure, you can't even look on evil. You can't even look on iniquity. How do we explain these things? Let's look at one more verse. James chapter 1, verse number 13. James 1 and verse number 13. This verse I would guess many more of us are familiar with here in James 1.13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. 
For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Now, once again, there sure seems to be some contradictions. Because, again, if we remember our Isaiah passage, the Lord made the statement, I create evil. Well, how could the Lord have created evil without him tempting anyone? Is it possible for the same Lord that says, I create evil, to be so pure he can't look on evil, and to be so pure he cannot tempt anyone with evil? Folks, throughout the ages, men have struggled with these issues. How evil ever came into existence, why evil does exist, how do we explain the Lord's role in the existence of evil? In this series, that's what we want to look at directly, head on. We want to try to come to an understanding of what the Bible teaches about the Lord's role in the existence of evil. What did the Lord do and what didn't the Lord do? I hope this study will be a great encouragement to us, and I hope it will be a learning experience for many of us. I know for myself, as I studied through to, to prepare this series, both to preach and then now to put it out on the blog, I learned a lot. I learned a lot about the existence of evil and the Lord's role in all of that. So what I would like us to do now is to begin our series on why does evil exist? Keeping in mind, we have these great seeming contradictions in the Bible where on one hand the Lord seems to come right out and say he creates evil, but on the other hand then we're told he's so pure he can't even look on evil and he doesn't tempt anyone. How can we come to an understanding of all these things? Over the next several lessons, we'll be coming, hopefully, to the biblical understanding. What the Bible teaches about this issue of God's role in the existence and the creation of sin. To begin our study, though, I think it is very, very, very important to understand what the word evil means. Because... That alone is a part of the problem. Because we don't have a proper understanding of the word evil, we can never come to a proper understanding of what the Bible verses teach us about evil. So before we get started, I would like us to look at what does the Bible mean when it talks about evil? What does it mean? The word evil is found in both the Old and the New Testaments. The word evil is translated by several different words. In the Old Testament, I believe there's basically three or four root Hebrew words that are translated evil. In the New Testament, I think there's as many as five or six Greek words that are the root words from which we get the word evil. So there's several different words translated evil. I have them listed for you in those notes that I told you about that you can download from the booklet. I have the very words listed and what they mean in the original languages. But for today's study on this video, let me just explain very quickly what you find if you study all of the different words translated evil in the Bible. There's basically one basic principle that all those words have in common with one another. It's the principle of something that is harmful. When the Bible talks about evil, it's talking about something that is harmful. In many cases, it talks about something that is so harmful, it can bring complete and total ruin. Whether it be to somebody's life or to nature or whatever the evil is affecting. But the point is, it always talks about something that's harmful. That's what the basic idea of evil means. So when the Bible uses the word evil, it's describing something that is harmful. And in many cases, it is so harmful, it can bring total ruin. It's interesting, if we study it a bit farther, here's what we find. 
The word evil can describe basically one of two types of things. The word evil, on one hand, can describe the act of sin itself. Sin is evil. So when we talk about things like, uh, let's just begin listing just some sins at random. Uh, stealing, that the Bible says is evil. Idolatry, where you worship other gods, that act is evil. How about uh, coveting someone else's property? To covet is an act that is evil. So on one hand, when the Bible uses the word evil, it's describing acts of sinfulness. Why would you describe sinful acts as evil? Because those sinful acts harm. They harm those who are committing the acts. And in many cases, they're harming other people who are, who are being sinned against. Like, for example, when I steal something from someone, that act of sin is going to bring harm. It's going to bring harm to me. It's going to, as a Christian, it's going to hurt my testimony. It's going to make me a less effective witness for the Lord. I'll lose rewards because I have stolen from someone. So it hurts me when I sin. Sin is something evil to me. It brings harm to me. But not only that, the person I stole from, they're harmed too because of the evil that I've committed. So you can see why the Bible would describe the act of sin as being evil. Sin itself brings harm to people. But then there's a whole nother group of things that the Bible describes as evil. Not just acts that are sinful, but also there's many things the Bible describes as evil that aren't acts of sin in and of themselves. For example, tornadoes are evil. Earthquakes are evil. Physical sickness is evil. Why? Why would the Bible in some cases use the word evil to describe those type of things? They're harmful. Tornadoes are harmful to man. Earthquakes are harmful to man. Physical sickness is harmful to man. So you can see when the Bible talks about things that are evil, we have to be careful to discern what type of thing are we talking about? Are we talking about in the context a sinful act? Or are we talking in the context about acts of perhaps nature, like earthquakes or tornadoes, things like physical sickness, that bring harm to man but are not acts that are immoral or that go against the law of God? So again, to me, that's the most basic understanding of evil that we can come to based on how the Bible uses the term. Whatever is evil is harmful. It can be sinful acts, or it can be, though, other type of actions that are harmful to man that do not involve breaking God's commands. They don't involve sin. Okay, now, let's take it one step farther. Whenever the Bible talks about evil, it's interesting. Okay, as you study this throughout the Bible, you're going to find something true in every case. Whenever the Bible talks about something that's evil, even though it may not be talking about an act of sin, it is always talking about something that is related to sin. Now let me say that again. Whenever the Bible uses the term evil, it talks about something that is related to sin. It might be a sinful act itself, or it might be something else, like a tornado, an earthquake, whatever, but it's still something that is related to sin. Now, let me give you just a few quick examples to help illustrate what we're talking about. Let's talk about the ten plagues in Pharaoh's day. If you remember when uh, the... Israelite children were held in bondage 
to the nation of Egypt and Pharaoh was over the nation of Egypt. He was the ruler of the nation of Egypt and he was keeping the Israelites in bondage. Okay. Pharaoh committed evil acts. He rebelled against the Lord. He refused to let God's people go. In other words, Pharaoh sinned. That sin was harmful. It ended up harming Pharaoh. It ended up harming his nation. And it ended up harming the Israelites. So you can see why Pharaoh's acts of rebellion are described as evil. But... That's not the only evil that took place in the story of the Ten Commandments, or in the story of the Ten Plagues. Each one of the Ten Plagues was evil in the sense they brought harm. Think about every one of them, and we'll just list a few of them. <clears throat> Water turning to blood. That wasn't an act of sin, but it was the direct result of Pharaoh's sin. It harmed the Egyptians. So that's his, so not only was Pharaoh's rebellion an act of evil in the sense that it was harmful, but the result of that sin, the water turning to blood, you can describe that as evil as well because it harmed the Egyptians. The only difference was turning the water to blood. When the Lord did that, he wasn't committing an act of sin. It w he was simply bringing about a result of an act of sin. Pharaoh's rebellion brought about the water turning to blood. Death of the firstborn, that's another one of the ten plagues. You can say the very same thing. In all of the ten plagues, we find what? We find results of the sinful acts of Pharaoh. Pharaoh sinned. He committed evil. That commission of evil resulted in other harmful acts taking place that were not sinful in and of themselves. But they were the result of of the sinful acts of Pharaoh. My point is this. When the Bible uses the term evil, once again, it can describe acts of sin, but it also can describe other things that are not sinful in and of themselves. But in every case, they're the result of sin. In the case of the ten plagues, the ten plagues were the result of Pharaoh's sin. You might say, okay, Brother Rob, yeah, there's a lot of times we can look through the Bible and we can see harm was the direct result of acts of sin. We see that all the time. For example, in other words, Noah's flood. I'm trying to pick out the ones we're most familiar with. Noah's flood. The Bible makes it plain. Why did the flood come? The flood came because of mankind's sinfulness. So there's a direct relationship there. Because mankind committed evil acts of sin, the evil of the flood came upon man. And by the evil of the flood, I mean something that was harmful to man came upon them. The flood. The flood was the direct result of an evil act, a sinful act. The flood harmed mankind. So in that sense, using the biblical meaning of evil, the flood can be described as something evil as well. Not because the flood in and of itself was sinful, but because it brings harm to man. Okay, I think we understand that. But some people might say, okay, I can think of all those different times when harmful things happen to man that are the direct result of the commission of sin. But Brother Rob, what about a tornado? Okay, a tornado hits. You just said that was something evil because it harms man. Okay. Does that mean that every time a tornado hits our country, it's the result of sin? Okay, let me ask a question. If sin never entered the world, let's say... We were still back in Adam and Eve's day in the Garden of Eden where there was no such thing as sin. 
Would tornadoes exist? Absolutely not. Would earthquakes exist if there was not sin? Absolutely not. Would floods take place if there was not sin? Absolutely not. Here's my point. There are some types of evil, there are some types of harmful events that take place that come upon mankind that we can't necessarily directly link back to any one known sin, but they certainly do exist because sin exists. Physical death. For a lost person, that's a harmful event that takes place. So in that sense, physical death is an evil that takes place upon mankind. In a sense, you can even say, well, you can directly link that back to the sinful condition of that individual, which is true. So in a sense, that is a direct result of the acts of sin that that individual committed and his sinful condition that he was born with and that he was conceived in. But in another sense, in a general wide sense, physical death is simply the indirect result of sin. Because mankind fell, physical death now comes into existence upon everyone, even animals, who are not guilty of sin. So I just want you to see, before we go any farther in our study, it's really important we understand what the Bible means by evil. Because if we don't understand what we just talked about, the rest of the study is very, very difficult to understand. So what do we mean by sin? I'm sorry, what do we mean by evil? What do we mean when the Bible uses the term evil? Evil means either an act of sin, an act that breaks the laws of God, or else it means other things that are harmful to man. In either case, those things are harmful to man. Either acts of sin or other types of events that take place are harmful to man. They're evil. In some cases, evil can be the direct result of sin. In other cases, it may be the indirect result of sin. But the bottom line is, you would not have evil in this world if there was no such thing as sin. So I guess what I'm saying is the existence of evil and the existence of sin go hand in hand. The only reason why mankind faces events and actions that harm them is because sin is present in the world. If you had no sin, you would have no evil in this world at all, meaning there would be nothing that would take place that is harmful to man in this world. That's the basic understanding that the Bible gives us of what an evil is. It's something that's harmful to man. It can be either a sinful act or the result of sin in the world. It can be directly linked to individual acts of sin, or in a lot of cases it can't be directly linked, but it still exists because sin exists. If it, it, there are many evils that exist simply because this world is a fallen world. Again, I'm talking about things like tornadoes in some cases, earthquakes in some cases. I mean, remember, in the Old Testament, there were times the Lord would send earthquakes to punish directly a sin that had been performed. So I'm talking about those earthquakes. I'm talking about those other earthquakes in general that happen. You can't necessarily point to a sin and say, it's because of that sin that was committed, that earthquake took place. We can't always do that. There's sometimes in the Bible we can, but you can't always do that. But it's still an evil. It's still a result of the existence of sin that's in this world. So let's keep in mind that definition of evil as we go forward in our study. Next time we're going to begin looking at the Lord's role in evil. Now that we understand what evil is, that will help us a lot to understand the Lord's role in evil. What role did the Lord play in the existence of evil? Okay, we'll look at that in more detail in our next study. May the Lord bless you as you study his word.